Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Curran, and I'm one of the ancient historians here at Queen's. And it's a great pleasure to have been invited to come and talk to you about uh, an aspect of my research this afternoon, um, and that is the figure of uh, Herod the Great. Um, and I'm posing the question this afternoon, was Herod antiquity as crazy as the king? Now, this is a really interesting time uh, at which to be uh, an historian, I think for two reasons. The first is the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, because there's never been a clearer illustration of the truth of the old Soviet era joke. The future is certain, it's the past that's unpredictable. Because the nature of history itself is under scrutiny. Is history an immutable fixity, set sometimes literally in stone? Is it a thing that people possess and the abandonment of which is a threat to their very identity? Or is history like other disciplines, above all the sciences, where knowledge develops with the discovery of new data? That history is a dynamic discipline that has within it the constant challenge to us to examine what we think we know about who we are. And the second reason why being an historian uh, just at the minute is interesting is the cause, of course, of the phenomenon of Donald Trump. What the advent of Donald Trump has done is to draw our attention back to the capacity of the personality and the will of a powerful individual to bring about change. It's not that the powerful man is simply interesting as a freestanding biographical subject. It's that he really is connected in the broadest way, not just to his own immediate world, but to the order of things far beyond it. So I suggest to you, taking these two points into consideration, that undertaking historical investigation into significant figures like Herod the Great isn't actually quite the same undertaking now as it was five years ago. Now let me mention one important thing uh, about our source material. In terms of literature, it's dominated by the great Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who lived and wrote three quarters of a century after Herod's death in 4 BC. But as often happens with ancient historians, Beneath the surface of his work lies the testimony of Nicholas of Damascus, long since lost, but a man who was Herod's most senior courtier. Let's begin with Shakespeare's Hamlet. Famously, in the second scene of Act Two, Hamlet instructs some players to put on a performance of a play that's designed to prick the conscience of his stepfather, whom Hamlet suspects of murdering Hamlet's real father and the legitimate king of Denmark. But Hamlet wants the thing done properly, with subtlety. He doesn't want it overacted and says to the key actor that it mustn't be overdone, complaining about over-the-top performances that can be seen all over the place. Of this kind of actor, Hamlet says, I would have such a fellow wit for or doing termagant it out Herod's Herod. This is a reference to the popularity in medieval and early modern Europe of a cycle of plays known as mystery plays, which told well-known stories from the Bible. The 16th play in the cycle is known as Herodes Magnus, Herod the Great. And in it, Herod is the embodiment of evil. And that's because the one thing that everyone then and now knows about Herod is this, that he was the perpetrator of one of the most notorious acts of villainy in the whole Bible. So back to Hamlet. Actors in the mystery plays enthusiastically played Hamlet, sorry, played Herod, as a hideous, cruel and insecure tyrant, creating a simple but powerful image of Herod that has been one of the most popular subjects in Western art ever since his death. And this has influenced the persistence of the idea of Herod as a demented and cruel figure. Now, there actually isn't any corroboration for the story in the New Testament, and many historians regard it simply as untrue. But actually, it's not surprising that such a story should have been in circulation in the later years of the first century AD, when the Gospel of Matthew was being written. And that's because during the lifetime of Herod and afterwards, there really were some notorious stories in circulation about him. And the most notorious of them concerned his family. Time for a bit of psychology. This is John Bowlby, 
He's a very influential theorist uh, when it comes to psychiatric uh, scholarship um, and uh, the practice of therapy. And his great contribution to the discourse on mental health was to create what's known as attachment theory. And to put things simply, attachment theory suggests that good mental health can be assessed by examining the quality of relationships a person has to other people. Above all, members of their own family and beginning in childhood. So if you want to assess the health of a patient, have a look at their family relationships. And as I'm speaking to you now, uh, this is a very live uh, area of interest in contemporary American and world politics. But as recently as 2006, Harold himself has been placed on the psychiatrist's chair and his own family relationships have been subjected to very close, close scrutiny. Now, before we have a look at Herod's family, there are a few things you need to understand about the context. First of all, it's important to realise that Herod was a man who, despite becoming king of the Jews, actually had no royal pedigree at all. There is the homeland of the Jews. It's called Judea. But Herod was actually from this place, Idumea, a place that didn't have any historic Jewish pedigree. It had only recently been Judaized within the previous hundred years or so. Now, the second thing you need to understand is that Herod, who became king of the Jews in 40 BC, displaced a previous uh, dynasty. They're known as the Hasmoneans. And you can see here, there's Herod the Great, uh, there is the first of these Hasmoneans whom Herod marries. And I want you to be aware that Herod marries again and again and again. A man, in fact, who had uh, up to uh, perhaps more than 10 wives. So, as I say, in 37 BC, Herod married this woman. And he married her because he was trying to ease the transition from his own relatively modest uh, uh, upbringing and background to what had been the royal status quo. The problem was that these people, the Hasmoneans, despised Herod. To make matters more complicated, Mariamne, who you see there, was a second wife. Herod already had a wife. And to make matters even worse, Herod fell deeply in love with her. And from the very beginning, Herod was tortured by fears that the Hasmoneans would destroy him and reclaim their throne. He lived with constant rumours of scheming on the part of the in-laws, a situation that generated within him uh, a generalised fear that threats were to be found all around him. Now, at first, Herod sought to placate these people. And if we look at the family tree here of the Hasmoneans, there is the woman whom Herod marries. There she is, Mariamne. And this is the man whom Herod decided to install as high priest uh, of the Jews um, in an attempt to placate the Hasmoneans in 35 BC. At the Festival of Tabernacles, however, in October of that year, the Jews who were attending were struck by Aristobulus's royal bearing, his handsomeness, and they showed so much love for him that Herod became deeply alarmed and had to bring about the death of the young man. And as a result of this, the hatred of the Hasmoneans for Herod increased even further. And there's another recurring historical feature of powerful men, and that is the particular threat they perceive to them posed by women. For many men, being overcome by a man is a defeat, but being overcome by a woman feels like an obliteration. And in Herod, there was a peculiar fear of powerful women, as there is with other leaders, as we know. 
And Mariame in particular seems to have been a particularly engaging and powerful woman. Here's her personality described by uh, Josephus. So Herod, who was a lover of women, found himself caught between his great love for person, his great love for Mariamme, and her disdain for him. And in the end, Herod's suspicions won out. Late in 29 BC, Herod became convinced that Mariamme was trying to poison him, and he had her executed. And here's a very famous romantic painting of. Uh, Mariame uh, receiving her sentence of execution. Herod here unable to look at the woman he's loved, the woman he loves, uh, who's been uh, convicted um, um, against uh, all the uh, evidence, all the reasonable evidence. Herod's love for Mariame refused, however, to die. As we've seen, uh, he would go on to marry at least eight more times, but seemingly he never came to terms with his great loss. And this doomed love affair has fascinated writers and artists for centuries. We've seen some of the romantic uh, painting. And in the ancient material, uh, the relationship occupied, um, you know, it occupied a great portion of uh, Josephus's work. Incidentally, um, the subject was uh, written about by the first ever woman to write a play in English. There she is, she's Elizabeth Carey, uh, and uh, her chosen subject was the tra tragedy of Mariam, the fair queen of Jewry. So uh, this love affair, this doomed love affair, um, was enduringly popular. With Mariam gone, however, the paranoia of Herod continued against the Hasmoneans, and now it settled on her children. Herod sent these children to be brought up at the court of the Emperor Augustus, but he became suspicious that they were trying to bring about his downfall. And he ended up putting them on trial, not once, but twice for treason. The first of these trials took place in 12 BC, before the Emperor himself sitting as a judge. And it culminated in this dramatic episode, where the Emperor couldn't find convincing uh, testimony uh, upon which to um, convict the sons, and they were reconciled to uh, Herod. Herod, as a result, took them back home to Judea, but after their return to Jerusalem, rumors began to reach Herod again, playing upon his insecurities. And in due course, a second trial was held, this time in Veritas, uh, modern Beirut, and before the governor of Syria, not the emperor. And this time, the sons were sentenced to death after their conviction. Let's look again at Herod's family tree. You can see that he was married, as I say, at least 10 times. This meant that there were lots of other potential heirs. And you can see them here. Running left to right, all the heirs of Herod. In his later years, when he was subject to an excruciating disease, he became increasingly paranoid that various people were trying to kill him, take over. And in the course of his last three years, he left at least seven different wills. Even as uh, late as 4 BC, shortly before his death, he executed another son, Antipater III. So what do you make of all this? Augustus uh, had uh, a famous insight, and he produced uh, a pun um, recorded by a late antique source and the pun plays upon the similarity of two Greek words, hus and huyos, pig and son. What's the diagnosis? This is the so-called DSM, the Manual of Mental Disorders, published by the American Psychiatric Association. And this is the recent psychological study of Herod. And it concluded that Herod, in line with the DSM, had suffered from a paranoid personality disorder, which degenerated into delusional disorder persecutory type. So Herod then was a man who wasn't at all well. But I suggest that if we're really to understand the historical Herod, 
we have to be prepared to consider more broadly. And what I want to do now, and for the rest of this talk, is to look at three aspects of herb that I think compel our attention and they encourage us to look at him in a much broader sense than simply his mental status. First, let's have a think about Herod and his Roman friends. And what I want to emphasize to you is that we should not be sentimental about who these Roman friends were. The Romans, at their best, were a predatory people intent on extracting from the whole East its wealth and resources for their own ends. And when these people fell into civil war with each other, their predatory instincts became even more extreme. And this that I'm presenting to you here is a quick roll call of the various Romans whom Herod came to impress. And there you see them. Sextus Julius Caesar, cousin of Gaius Julius Caesar, then Cassius, who of course is the killer of Caesar, then Mark Antony, who's the killer of Cassius, then Octavian, who's the destroyer of Mark Antony. In fact, Herod can only have survived by finding a way of working with all these uh, unscrupulous, bloodthirsty, vicious Romans. And he did it because he showed them the kind of self-confidence, political ruthlessness and proficiency in the use of violence that always impressed the Roman upper class. But he knew how to flatter them as well. Here's the famous meeting between Herod and Octavian after the Battle of, 30, uh, after the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, the battle which brought Octavian rule over the whole Mediterranean. And my point here is that Herod needed remarkable skill and courage in establishing himself with these Romans, and he showed amazing self-possession um, in their company. Here, for example, after one successful display um, or one successful intervention on behalf of the Jews, a remarkable public display of affection between a high-born Roman and a subject leader took place. And um, I emphasize the intimacy of this um, um, the intimacy of this hug is really quite a remarkable uh, phenomenon in such a hierarchical society as, as that of uh, the late Roman Republic and early Empire. Now Herod made such an impression on uh, these upper class Romans that they even went as far as to pay for uh, daily sacrifices to Herod's own god. Uh, reportedly the sacrifices were a bull and two lambs offered every single day and these sacrifices continued right up until AD 66 uh, when the Jews finally uh, rebelled against Rome. Now, one famous passage, Josephus says that the Romans were so impressed by Herod that they even contemplated giving him the whole of the province of Syria to administer. Uh, modern historians, modern commentators um, don't consider this to be credible, but I'm struck by one uh, interesting word in the text of Josephus. And the text is, or the text reads that he possessed Megala Sukia, um, which uh, has two meanings. One is arrogance um, and is often preferred by those who see Herod as an unstable person. But in fact, it seems to me that there is another meaning that makes more sense. And that is the meaning of greatness of soul. And I suggest to you that greatness of soul is actually more plausible when we have a look at two areas of Herod's activity. The first is that Herod was really, really serious about his Judaism. He was extremely um, sensitive to the ban, the traditional ban um, required by the Jewish Bible on images. And here we see the famous temple of Herod. Uh, here's a model of it from uh, Jerusalem. And Herod's temple uh, dominated the whole of the ancient city. Um, and it was a temple that uh, contained no, um, or depiction of no living creature, absolutely in line with uh, Jewish uh, religious law. It contained within it no icon, uh, no image. Herod also had the temple itself constructed in a really scrupulous way. He had thousands and thousands of priests trained 
to work on the uh, construction of the structure so that no impure hand would be seen to have um, uh, worked on it. And you can see here the very, very careful arrangement of uh, space within the temple to ensure that the purity regulations were um, uh, absolutely um, uh, without compromise uh, observed. And the Jewish Talmud uh, preserves a famous judgment of uh, this marvelous temple, um, which was renowned throughout the whole of the Eastern uh, Empire. The grandeur of this building, which was probably the most famous building in the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean, of course, uh, made, a ref made a, a, an appearance in the New Testament as well, where the uh, disciples of Jesus are amazed at what they find when they finally come to Jerusalem. But Herod was something else again. He was a great Greco-Roman man. Here's Caesarea Maritima, or its remains, on the Mediterranean coast. In the time of Jesus, this was the capital of the province of uh, Jerusalem. Sorry, this was the capital of the province of Judea. Uh, the capital wasn't Jerusalem. And this place, Caesarea Maritima, was one of the best designed Greek cities in the Roman Empire. Look at that lovely uh, orthogonal, uh, orderly street uh, layout. Look at those great Greek civic amenities, Hippodrome, Forum, Aqueduct, Temple, Theatre. And the harbour with its lighthouse was a technological marvel, featuring the latest Roman invention, what's called maritime concrete. Concrete that was lowered into the water in great frames and that actually set, uh, set solid under the uh, waves. But Herod's enthusiasm for Greek and Roman culture went literally much further. He paid for colonnades in Antioch, baths and fountains in Ashkelon, and he endowed the Olympic Games with a massive donation designed to keep the Games going forever. Two generations after his death, Herod was remembered in Athens as the great king patron of that city. And his palaces showed some of the finest examples of Roman, Roman interior decor so perfectly executed that experts think that the technicians and craftsmen must have, must have been imported from Italy. Here, for example, from perhaps Herod's most famous uh, palace on Masada, is a classic Roman hypercost uh, heating system. Also from Masada, were recovered amphorae of vintage Italian wine. And we have uh, vintages from uh, at least four years uh, separate years. So uh, Herod was uh, an imbiber of the finest uh, Italian wine. The man pictured holding uh, this fragment here is the great uh, Israeli archaeologist uh, Ehud Netzer. And uh, Professor Netzer in 2007 discovered the resting place of Herod at uh, another one of Herod's palaces called uh, Herodium. And Herodium too featured um, tremendous examples of um, Greco-Roman, particularly Roman um, decoration. There on the left hand side we have an example of Pompeian wall painting and on the right painting from Herodium executed with uh, very high skill by what are taken to be imported Italian uh, artists. Again from Herodium and Pompeii. On the left is Pompeii, on the right, uh, Herodium. Showing Herod's love of Italianate uh, bucolic scenes. So Herodium, as I say, was the uh, resting place of Herod, but it turned up one puzzle, and that was what seems to be Herod's sarcophagus, um, which is a curiously uh, subdued monument. It's a uh, um, done in the finest, uh, in the finest uh, marble, but uh, very unornate, very simple. So to conclude on Herod, I would suggest to you that he was demonstrably a man who was undone by his passions. But I don't think we do him any justice if we focus just on them. 
his capacity to influence the most powerful men of the age and to weave his way between their conflicts with each other is testimony, I think, to exceptional shrewdness and intelligence. And what we've seen is his confident participation in at least three cultures. And I think that identifies him as a remarkably centripetal force. And by that I mean he was capable of keeping within one personality a rich diversity of ideas in just the way that he kept a kingdom full of diverse peoples under a single government. And lastly, when we look at this sarcophagus, this seeming puzzle, is it possible that at the very end we see evidence in Herod of perhaps the sanest of all thoughts? With this simple sarcophagus, is it possible that we're in the presence here of a man who understood that no matter how powerful and wealthy you are in life, you can't take any of it with you when death comes calling?